and for everyone online as well. Um, my name's Ellie Kent. I'm uh, part of the Indonesian Studies Group. Uh, what are we, a committee or, uh, yes, the committee. Um, and it's really my pleasure today to be here to um, introduce our speaker, Ipmawan Saiful, uh, Saifullah, sorry. Um, before we begin, I'd just first like to acknowledge uh, the and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and future, and especially those who might be joining us today. Um, we remain indebted to you as we learn and grow on your country. This is a hybrid event, so we will be taking questions from those uh, in the room at the end and online, so we'll do that at the end. Um, when you have a question, if you're online, could you please write it in the uh, question Q&A box and we'll read them out to the room um, at the end of the uh, session. And so, as I mentioned before, today we're here to uh, introduce Hikmawan Saifula, otherwise known as Indra, um, whose thesis was recently passed, I believe, uh, whose uh, PhD thesis was recently passed with excellent positive remarks from the assessment panel. So congratulations, Indra, it's a really great achievement. Um, Indra is a lecturer in the Department of International Relations uh, at Pajajaran University and a fellow in the Center for Muslim Politics and World Society. Uh, uh, and also in the, oh, sorry, at the, or the Center for Muslim Politics and World Society at the Indonesian International Islamic University. My apologies. Um, he's been involved in the Indonesian underground music scene as a musician and a fan since the mid 1990s. And his PhD in politics is uh, titled Transformations of Youth Resistance Underground Music Scene and Islamic Politics in Post Authoritarian Indonesia, which he completed at Murdoch University. And Indra, today we'll be talking about the Indonesian underground music scene, um, which was known in the Reformasi era as a bastion of the progressive left and radical leftist uh, politics for urban youth. But after Reformasi experienced a transformation influenced by the emergence of right-wing Islamic underground movements and other factors, which uh, Indra will be explaining to us today uh, in his seminar, which examines the ideological and organisational shift of some underground music scene participants from secular, progressive and leftist politics towards Islamic conservatism and right-wing Islamism in post-authoritarian Indonesia. So, uh, Indra, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um... Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming and uh, thank you for Ellie uh, for introducing me uh, to the audience and also to any Indonesia project uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, prestigious seminar. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I actually had lots of stories that I can use to start my presentation today. Uh, in the last few days, I've been thinking a lot about this and then I ended up uh, uh, with an idea that I probably should start my presentations with playing uh, a video on YouTube. And this video is made by uh, my friend in, in our band, it's called Lone Atlas. His name is Rizky or Uchai. Uh, that's what his nickname is. And then from there, I will start my presentation. So bear with me. And just to let you know that this video contains music that's probably a little bit too hard for some people, too loud, but this is what makes you, you know, helps you to be awake instead of relying on caffeine. So um, hopefully you like this song as a beginning. Very low, isn't it? Silakan terkeluhkan Tinggal di hadapan Dan kejahatan yang terjadi Buatlah sejarah Cara yang tak dicara Tentang penyuk sekali Untuk penyawa
salahmu dan bangkit dari 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 salahmu dan bangkit jangan sejarah okay that was the song okay was that Uh, yeah, bits of them, yeah. But most of it, um, that was during my in hiatus uh, time where I quit from the band. This one, yeah? Okay. Uh, for two years, for some personal reasons, but then I returned and then created another album. Um, so when I returned in 2008, uh, I was actually doing my master's degree uh, here at ANU. And... Once I finished my thesis, my master thesis, and I go back to Indonesia, I had lots of ideas. I don't know, this is what this just did to, you, to, to your brain. There are lots of ideas to compose new songs, and then I distributed lots of songs, composed many of them, and then it becomes an album called Integrity. Yeah, that's the band. So I was an underground rock musician before I became an academy. And I didn't intend to be a musician. It was really popular in the 1990s where High Magazine, Uh, MTV, Asia, music channels, pretty much given lots of influence, a deep influence to young people like me in the 1990s. And we become uh, familiar with Western popular cultures, especially underground music. You know. Maybe for some people, Green Day, it's not considered punk because they pretty much sell out and they sign uh, record deals with uh, cor uh, corporate record labels. Well, actually, Green Day has impacted people like me at the time, and we become know about punk rock. What is punk? Uh, what is the music? And what is the ideology and all that? So I'm, I'm not a unique person at the time. There are thousands of young people like me who was pretty much influenced by underground music, specifically punk at the time. And I played in several punk uh, or underground bands uh, since the mid-1990s. And the last one was uh, Alone at Last until I resigned in 2013 uh, because I was doing my, started to prepare my for my PhD. Yeah. And the song that you just listened to through the video clip is actually a song called Sekali Untuk Perinyawa, which means wants to live. And uh, this uh, song compared to other songs plays, uh, uh, holds a very special memory to me because it reminds me of the people, of the places and events that inspired me to write my PhD about the under Indonesian underground music scene. Uh, it also reminds me especially that underground is not only a place for young people just to have fun dancing and singing together. It's actually a place where young people can find a free space, an alternative free space where they can free themselves you know, without being interfered by family or other forms of authorities. Yeah. And then it is also a place where we can forge an alternative form of solidarity beyond class, age, religion, education, uh, differences. Yeah. So anyone can join uh, in the underground scene, in the underground communities, everybody can hang out. Everybody can be a punk, even though they don't know how to play music, they can play music, and especially punk music, because it's really easy just to play with three chords. And, um, and then the second thing is that this song reminds me Uh, of the people behind the productions of the, that song, especially the whole album, uh, that where some of the people that I know that I used to close with, they have changed. They have practiced what uh, recently uh, scholars of Indonesian Islam uh, called it hijrah, yeah? or which means emigrating from one place to another place, but in Islamic term, hijrah has been reinterpreted as Uh, shifting from the secular, uh, from the past secular sinful life to Islamic life, to become a better person uh, within the Islamic frame. And then the first person that reminds me of uh, those who, who change uh, in the hijrah is actually, if you remember the beginning of the song, there's a growling voice. Uh, that's the voice of uh, Aldoni, aka Tempak. He's a punk veteran uh, and used to sing and just amazing frontman from a legendary punk band from Bandung It's called uh, Jiruji, yeah. Um, he is now no longer singing and he's no longer in a band. And he believed that music is actually haram or forbidden in Islam and it is sinful. And 
he did hijrah in 2015, and until now he doesn't want to be involved in any kind of music activities because he believes that it's sinful. And it's not only Dempak. Uh, there's also uh, a great guy, uh, Nur Al Kausta, aka Uchai, who used to tour together with me when I was still in Olot Atlas. Uchai was uh, the frontman of Indonesian famous Indonesian pop punk band called Rocket Rockers. Yeah. And he played lots of synthesizers parts in our album, yeah? uh, in our album uh, called Jiwa. It's released in 2006, and Sekali Untuk Bernyawa was part of that album. He put lots of amazing synthesizers there. And again, like Tempa, he decided to start playing music and believe that music is haram. And then furthermore, my best friend, amazing guy, uh, Rizky Hasibuan, you saw some of his acts. He played guitar at one at last in the past. Uh, he, I still remember in 2016, a few weeks before I decided to go back to Perth after I finished my field work, he said, you know, remembering that many of our friends uh, have gone hijrah, he said, I would never done hijrah and I would never stop playing music as long as Azan or the calling to Islamic, uh, uh, calling to, uh, for Islamic prayer still sounded with a tune. Because in fact, Azan itself is a music. He said, as long as Azan is sounded with a tune, I would never stop playing music. And you know what? A year later, he called me and he felt galau. Or galau is more like, um, what's in English, galau? Um, pretty much demoralized, uh, disempowered. And he said to me that he wants to do hijrah. And he was laughing because I was laughing at my friends who did hijrah. But now I don't know, I feel like I need to do hijrah. I don't want to play music. Every time I listen to music, it makes me want to vomit. He said, really? He said, Maybe you know you're possessed or something. Said, no, 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 no. Like I really enough with music. I don't want to play music. I just want to focus on learning my own religion. And amongst all, the last one is the producer, our producer uh, in the first and second album uh, himself. His name is Andika. He's an ex-member of a Bandung-based punk band called Tarto Jumio. Uh, he was the one who actually played a big part in the production of our music and distributions of our music. And he also ended up uh, doing hijrah and started playing music. So when I listen to this song, it's kind of feel, there's a feel of excitement that it reminds me of my tours and performances during my music. Uh, career in the past, but at the same, I feel sad because some of those, these great people were actually pretty much, you know, not in my circle anymore. Well, Uchai, uh, Lonata's former guitarist, is still in contact with them, we're still good friends. It's just uh, knowing that these talented musicians who have amazing skills and gifts to play music just decided not to, you know, play music anymore. Yeah. And which I and I used to spend lots of time hanging out and composing music and just like, no, sorry. I can listen to, but no, I don't want to play music anymore. So it kind of made me feel sad. Yeah. But the practice of hijrah yeah, was really popular when I came down to the film work between 2015 and 2018. Yeah. It was a big phenomenon that everybody in the underground scene talking about it. So I was wondering why these things happen. And then I was looking for an answer, academic answers, including uh, some books and articles from the scholars of Indonesian Islam who wrote about the conservative turn. Yeah. There are some good stuff in there. Yeah. There are some good stuff where I can find out or understand how conservative uh, Islam and right-wing Islamism pretty much uh, popular amongst Indonesian Muslim societies. Uh, because of the role and activities of certain Islamic organizations and institutions. Yeah. And also the spread of Islamic uh, conservative uh, narratives and right-wing Islamist ideology that goes through mosques, schools, and universities, and even in underground hangouts. Yeah. Um, but the things that this literature of conservative turn, the scholars, fail to explain the conservative turn in the underground scene itself, so the subcultural youths, people like Uchai, people like Andika, people like Tempa, they were ignored, they were overlooked. So I was disappointed with the fact that I could not find the answer because these underground participants, they're not only musicians, they're not only people who are looking for fun. 
Some of our friends in the underground scene are actually really active politically, and they joined or participated in uh, radical leftist movements in the late 1990s, such as when there's an establishment of FIF, for instance, the Anti-Fascist Front, or Front Anti-Fascist, and then Anti-Fascist Anti-Racist, Afra in Jakarta, RE Woods in Semarang, and many others. And dozens of them were working together, coordinate with each other, to continue the struggle against the new order, which they believe, even though Suharto has failed in May 1998, but his legacy still remains, especially when his cronies, people who supported him during the new order, still in power. Okay. But then what happens after that um, is uh, unexplained. I think the last part of this change is that where this leftist underground movement become declining, no longer popular. Um, it was written by, uh, investigated by Joanna Picos, Joe Picos, who wrote some articles, the thesis about that, actually how underground youth in Indonesia were actually politically active and they're conducting the system to make, uh, to create change. Yeah. But then there's no explanations after that, you know, why they turn really conservative and become more attracted to Islamism. Yeah. So what happened during the conservative period is that there's lots of uh, events that happen and explain the situation at the time. First, religious based tensions and conflicts, yeah, and also terror attacks uh, from the early 2000s until, you know, uh, 2000, uh, early 2000s until recently, yeah, and also the emergence of conservative and right wing Islamist groups such as FPI, Hizbut Tahrir. Uh, Unmute. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so the conservative term is also defined by the emergence of conservative and right wing Islamist groups such as FPI, Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia, uh, Majid Mujahidin Indonesia, Laskar Jihad, and many others. Yeah. And there is also a fatwa uh, made by Majelis Ulama Indonesia that pretty much bans pluralism, secularism, and also uh, liberal Islam. Is they considered an Islamic and is haram for Muslims to you know hold on those values basically. Yeah. And then also uh, there was a number of Islamist mobilizations in this period, such as the International Caliphate Conference in 2007. It was organized by Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia, and some of underground participants joined that mobilization. And then there's also uh, Aksi Bela Islam in 2016, 2017 and then the anti-liberal Islam protest in 2012, and also some other participants joined those Islamist mobilizations. So this is to emphasize that it is really important to understand this ideological shift amongst other participants, participants, remembering that they're actually participating in this Islamist mobilizations. Yeah? And uh, also there is the emergence of what's so-called as the Islamic underground movement. Yeah, including what is so-called as one finger underground movement, and then his Tahrir uh, link liberation youth and humble community, and also pan Muslim underground tahid, pan hijrah, and they have been actively recruiting underground youth in order to join their political cause. Well, political and religious cause because some of them uh, not really political. Yeah, and the last one is actually the emergence of the hijrah movements, and there are two very influential hijrah movements that have been. 
uh, active in recruiting or converting young people, including in the underground scene, is that the strangers al Guroba, which is Salafi based, Salafi oriented, and also shift gerakan pemuda hijrah. This is more like mix, but uh, there's a strong Salafi influence there as well. Yeah. And just to let you know that this movement is really sectarian. Yeah, they don't like Ahmadiyya, they don't like Shiites, they don't like liberal Muslims, and they're also against LGBT. So what makes these young people, yeah, turn really conservative, yeah, and um, you know, directly and indirectly participating in the Islamist mobilizations, and why they created this Islamic underground movement? Yeah. Since the existing literature on conservative group failed to explain this phenomenon among the underground scene participants, I then uh, posed a question in my thesis. So why did some underground scene participants shift to conservative Islam and right-wing Islamism in post-authoritarian Indonesia? Yeah. So my argument is that the transformations itself, the transformations of underground scene, including the most recent towards conservative Islam and Islamism, reflect the transformations of youth resistance in response to different socio-political and economic conditions that have disempowered and marginalized them. Yeah. And then because there's no strong or coherent leftist activism and narratives within the underground scene in post-authoritarian era, then they're looking for a new ideological alternative and also organizational, organizational alternatives. And that's where they found uh, that uh, conservative Islamism pretty much, pretty much become the alternative for their resistance. Yeah. So I did, uh, I conducted ethnographic field works in Bandung, Jakarta, and Surabaya. Yeah? Uh, I did participant observation there between 2015 2018. And I collected data through Nongkrong, basically. Nongkrong is Indonesian, uh, Indonesian term for hanging out. Yeah? And there I conducted semi formal interviews and conversations with all participants, both male and female. I was trying to find the non heterosexual participant, but it's very hard to find them because uh, being non heterosexual, let's say part of LGBT, is pretty much like socially, um, apa namanya ya, uh, semacam tidak boleh. You're not allowed to declare that you're gay or lesbian, including in the other council, even though some of the people don't care about that stuff. Yeah. And then um, I also use a secondary research where. I use some scholarly literature, lots of them, and also seen literature such as fan scenes and web scenes, the one that used to be uh, circulated in the late 1990s and early and mid 2000s, because these fan scenes contain lots of memories, ideas that were written by uh, key scene, underground scene figures, and they're pretty much no longer active in scene, some of them. Yeah. And then I use contemporary subcultural, uh, contemporary subcultural theory uh, as an analytical framework where it emphasizes that youth subcultural practices like the underground youth uh, with their music and styles as political. And also it emphasizes that what they're doing, their subcultural practices is a form of resistance or response or solution to their socioeconomic problems. Yeah. So it is actually political economy. Yeah. And then the contemporary subculture theory, unlike with the previous subculture theory, uh, well, I don't want to talk about theory too much, uh, basically believe that subculture is actually um, can be a bridge to social movements. So those who are wearing punk style, warhawks with uh, leather jacket, boots, you know, ripped t-shirts, safety pins and all that, that is a form of passive resistance which in the end, they can uh, develop their resistance into active forms of resistance by creating semi-autonomous cultural uh, productions and also engage in social movements, like what I'm going to explain to you soon. Yeah. So how the Indonesian underground movement become resistant, become a, a movement uh, that changes the society, especially the young people at the time. Yeah. There are two important periods for the beginnings of uh, for the birth of the Indonesian underground movement. The first one is the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, some scholars who studied about Indonesian underground movement, uh, mostly they say that you know underground music and stars only come around 1990s, but it's actually already there in 1970s. Yeah. The thing is that in 1970s, uh, the consumption of underground music, such as uh, what was did by this amazing band called AKA Indonesia Rock Band. Probably know about this then. Yeah. 
So the articulations of underground music at this time, yeah, for, first is only consumed mostly by middle to upper class young people. And then second, it is a form of disorderly uh, articulations yeah, of their expressions against the socioeconomic conditions at the time. Yeah. So the young people who consumed this music in 1970s, they were not disappointed with the fact that the new order that was built by Suharto, led by Suharto, is turning to political authoritarianism. So this is the beginning of the young people disappointment, Indonesian young people disappointment towards the new order. And that music in the 1970s became a soundtrack, basically. The thing is, uh, this is different. The, 90, the underground music consumption in the 1970s is different to the 1990s. In the 1990s, where uh, media technologies has become more uh, advanced, and then the circulations of Western pop cultures become more um, global, with the use of internet and then also uh, MTV channels can be accessed by young people across Indonesia from Sabang sampai Merauke. And then underground music become a consumption of all young people of all classes, basically, yeah? from working class, middle class to upper class. Yeah? And then the difference with the 1990s, uh, with the 1970s underground is that in the 1990s, these young people is not only expressing or consuming underground styles and music for fun. Yeah. They actually articulating it into or developing it into a form of resistance. They engage with social movements. And then like what happened in the late 1990s, where some of punk or underground figures joined a famous Indonesian leftist organization called PRD or People's Partai, Partai Rakyat Demokratik. Um, so PLD has been influential for organizing resistance against the new order. And for underground youth, who were already rebellious with their musical styles, they, some of them they realized that the resistance has to be more articulated, need to be more organized, so they joined PLD. And the PLD people said, okay, you can join our organization, but you have to create your own organization in the underground scene in order to mobilize your friends. So these punks, some of them people like uh, Pamuji Islamat or Pam, who is the front uh, man of uh, Pam from Bandung, Runta, and then also Uchok Homicide, uh, is the, uh, the, uh, the owner of Grimlock Records in Bandung. They joined PRD and then they created this anarchist collective uh, called uh, Front Antifascist. And Front Antifascist has become an umbrella for any underground use punks, metalheads, rappers, in order to join mobilizations against the new order. Yeah. So, um, and then during 1997, 1998, 1999, uh, 1999 uh, many of FIF members become involved in various leftist mobilizations, yeah? including when their top league Suharto joining student mobilizations or movements, and then uh, it was successful. They toppled Suharto on 21st of May, 1998. And then there was this, I still remember, there was this like short period of happiness, excitement that Suharto uh, finally toppled after more than 30 years uh, become our president. Yeah? Uh, but then this excitement did not, lost, uh, did not last very long. Yeah? And then because soon we realized actually nothing's really changed. Yeah? So uh, then we come to the period where we call it as demoralisasi dan kekecewaan, disillusionment, disillusionment, demoralisation, and despair, where underground youth pretty much become more critical, not only to the new government, not the post, not only to post Suharto leadership, but also with their own fellow activists and movements, and that can be explained by two factors. Uh, by external factors and internal factors. Yeah. First, there are some factors that beyond uh, the control of underground city participants that the fact, you know, the post-war leaders pretty much failed them and they did not fulfill their promises to create reformasi. Yeah. And this created skepticism and political apathy amongst underground city participants yeah, since early 2000, since 1999 actually, until pretty much today. Yeah. And there's also the fact that in post-authoritarian Indonesia, yeah, uh, it's also we're still struggling with poverty and many underground scene participants are struggling with unemployment. So uh, even though they're working or employed in some institutions, they pretty much don't get a decent income. So this will uh, this make them 
feel like really anxious, uh, precarious, fragile, and they that they ended up um, relying on working in music events, entertainment events. Okay? And this is usually supported by tobacco companies. And this is the era where underground music scene is no longer rebellious for some people because it's already co-opted by these tobacco companies who supported them, supported their events with lots, lots of money, like billions of rupees. Yeah. And also the, the, at the same time is that there's a continuous repression against democratic uh, movement, especially from the left, yeah, the shutdowns of leftist discussions, the arrest of left activists and all that, and also the co-optations of leading leftist figures I don't have to mention the names, they pretty much demoralized uh, the people uh, on the grassroots. Yeah. And then the internal factors is that uh, in, in the, since the beginning of the post authoritarian era until now, yeah, there's this polarization, fragmentation, and also stagnancy within the scene, where activists within the underground scene, also outside underground scene, especially those related to the PRD, had fallen out. Yeah. And then in 1990, is it 1999 or 2000, if I'm not mistaken, that many people in the FIF decided to withdraw their support of the LRD because they realized that LRD is not a form of political party. Basically, they're working for establishment. They're not really rebellious anymore. And also the fact that LRD, according to my participants at FIF, has become more authoritarian than democratic because every time they uh, organizing protests or mobilizations in factories, supporting the laborers for their work rights and all that. It is always PRD at the center who ask the FIF people on the ground to do what they, what we have to say in that protest. So that is a form of authoritarianism that pretty much uh, uh, made this, uh, my participants uh, kecewa or disappointed. And also, there are many ideological conflict between between them, between the anarchists and uh, socialists, which is very uh, historical. Yeah, and then they become really polarized and fragmented. Yeah, and then also the fact there's no images of rebellious underground anymore in this period. Yeah, after Suharto era, there's no uh, there's no uh, non-commercialized underground events. Almost all underground events are pretty much supported by tobacco companies. There are a few of them uh, who conducted DIY shows, which is like small uh, concerts with no barricades, like the stage, which is really, really uh, shallow, and then they can sit together. Maximum of people attending probably only 40 or 50, but it's not as big as you know, uh, the tobacco company sponsored events, which can invite young people for like thousands of people. Yeah. And so at the same time, uh, these rebellious underground youth who are disappointed with the post authoritarian condition uh, pretty much become older. Yeah? And they, uh, they, they have been struggling uh, in their life for, to make change, to create change, but in the end they realize there's not much change that we have made. And then uh, they become older and they get married and they have more social and financial capabilities, especially when they have wife and kids. So they're focusing on more searching for financial income instead of you know conducting rebellion or resistance through these uh, movements. Yeah. And then at the same time, when the leftist activism declines, Islamic conservatives rise and even sponsored by the state. I think a number of Indonesian uh, Indonesianist uh, literatures have explained about this, and it's actually proven during the SBA era that many conservative and right-wing Islamist groups supported financially by the state. Yeah. And then, because there's no absent, uh, because Nepo, there's no coherent leftist activism within the underground scene, and then these formerly rebellious underground youth were seeking for a new way of thinking to create change, because the left it was no longer popular, the narrative no longer there in the scene. They actually saw something new, something different, and it's more powerful, more organized, and that is right-wing Islamist organizations and movements. Yeah. Okay, I have five left, five minutes left. So uh, the emergence of Islamic underground movement, uh, based on my research, the earliest one is actually the one that is formed by Hizbut Tahrir, who's been who'd been actively recruiting young people at schools and universities and underground uh, hangouts. Yeah, and they created uh, collectives like left like leftist underground collectives. Yeah but they made a different content in it. It's more like Islamist content. Yeah. 
The first and uh, the first one is actually is called Liberation Youth. Yeah. Uh, Liberation Youth uh, is built in Bandung by former, well, claimed to be former FIF member who felt this solution with the leftist movements to create change, and then they moved to uh, create a liberation youth. Yeah. Same thing with Hamburg community, and there are dozen others, the underground collectives that are linked to Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia. Yeah. Um, they have been active in producing uh, alternative media like what the 1990s underground youth and activists did, yeah, creating fanzines. It looks like leftist, but when you see inside, it's actually how to create jihad, you know, and how uh, how to conduct jihad, you know, why caliphate is the solution, for instance, how Islam has the answer for everything and all that. Yeah. And then this is former underground youth who joined the uh, Hatta'i Link uh, Collective in the International Caliphate Conference. Yeah. So if you see them, you look like they're leftists, but actually they're Hizbutali, they're right wing Islamists. Yeah. And then there's also one finger underground movement and one finger underground movement is actually pretty much like underground movement. They're playing music, they're musicians, but the lyrics, their songs is dedicated to spread Islamic messages. They believe that underground scene has been, underground scene participants, especially young people, has been corrupted what they believe as God's world victory or the invasions of the minds, a conspiracy of the West to corrupt Muslims and the Islamic world. So they believe that US work on terrorism is not only attacking the radical Muslim, but also Muslims in general by corrupting, by uh, making young, young Muslims become distant to their own faith and all that. So they try to revive Islamic ideas, Islamic religion. So young people uh, can be you know, holding on to their uh, religion strongly. And this is the events that they made. Yeah. Uh, Islamic magazine Sabili covered the story of One Finger Underground Movement and believed that the One Finger Underground Movement musicians were actually the mujtahid, the, you know, the, the, the young scholars who have different methods, unique methods to spread Islam. Yeah. Okay, I don't have my stuff. And then uh, the thing is that with One Finger Underground Movement, similar to the leftist underground movement, they're not, they're not forever solid in their movement. They had fallen out. Yeah. Uh, Richard Stephen Gosal, a Muslim convert, uh, who is known as Tufal al Kifari now, yeah. he believed that some of the elements in the One Finger Underground Movement contain season. And season is another sect of Islam, a minor sect of Islam, that uh, they believe to be deviant. Yeah. So Tufal decided to you know, uh, resign uh, from One Finger Underground Movement, and they created another collective called Gurabah Militan Tawhid, which then later turned into Underground Tawhid. Yeah. There's also Pang Muslim, and this is me and the founder of Pang Muslim in Jakarta. Pang Muslim is actually a collective for street punks who live in the streets, in the slums areas of Jakarta, and because they have no you know, proper works and uh, they don't have parents or family, uh, Zaki through punk Muslim pretty much helping these street punks in order to live their life, giving them training, active in Islamic philanthropy, uh, and pretty much uh, teaching them skills that be useful uh, for life. And also, this is uh, Aditya Abdurrahman. He's a great guy. He used to be a hardcore anarchist in the late 1990s. Yeah. He became disappointed with the leftist movements and ideas in the early 2000s. And then he decided to do hijrah in 2006 and created a uh, joint uh, to Fal Bifari in Kuraba Mitan Tauhid, but then they had fallen out. So he created Pan Muslim in Surabaya. So Zaki created in Jakarta. And then uh, Ad, uh, Aditya Abdurrahman created Pan uh, Muslim in Surabaya. And that's what the activity is doing, uh, doing the what's so called as Pan Kajia. We've been studying learning Islam through the punk style. Okay, I don't have much time. And I is actually a lecturer in uh, a prestigious university in Surabaya. And he was active writing fanzines in the late 1990s when he was an anarchist. So he used his skills, his DIY journalism skills by uh, creating fanzines and books that it's pretty much readable for underground scene participants. And this has been circulated not only in mosques and campuses in Indonesia, but also through underground hangouts. And it's really pretty much effective because 
many of those dissolution under council participants were looking for answers and guidance for their life. And then they're looking for Islam, but they don't know how to learn Islam. And this media is actually really helpful for them to find like, you know, answers. Pretty much like, uh, Islam for dummies, basically. Like really easy stuff to read. So for those who did the Sanskrit education in the past, when they read this, you're like, oh, really, really basic. But it's really helpful for the street punks uh, who, who are not uh, familiar with uh, religious education. And it's not only in religious activities that Pak Muslim was active, but also in polit political activities. They believe that Indonesia should be led by a Muslim leader. So they joined the 2016 and 2017 uh, Islamist mobilization, Aksi Bela Islam, and they believe that Ahok should be punished. When I was in Jakarta doing field work, there are other members, but not Pak Muslim, uh, were against uh, Ahok, and he's really hardcore, still really young, said really, really nasty things about Ahok. And I don't have to say it here, but it's like, wow, that's great. Just showing that how people in this kind of organizations are really poor. So they, they don't uh, have a, a familiar uh, characteristic from one to another. It's just that from the moderate until the radical is pretty much there. Um, and then the last one is the birth of Hijrah movement. So those who are not interested anymore in subcultural articulations and expressions and activities, let's say in one underground movement or pan-Muslim, they decided to just get rid of the subcultural uh, stuff from their life. So they become purely Muslim and they want to focus on studying religion. And the first Hijrah movement is called the Strangest Art Europa. It is established by underground and indie rock musicians in Jakarta. They believe Salafism is their manhaj or their way of life. Uh, how to learn, uh, study, or practice Islam, and they believe that music, music is haram, and they've been propagating that amongst their under, uh, musician circles, and that affected quite big and many in, uh, under, Indonesian underground and indie musicians became influenced by their uh, campaign uh, until Rolling Stone Indonesia magazine covered a special story about how musicians, underground and indie musicians, have gone hijrah. Uh, in 2014, 15, and 16. Yeah. And then in Bandung, there's shift Gerakan Pada Hijrah, known for like have a different underground scene participants there, musicians, skaters, surfers, athletes, uh, actors, uh, or you know, just ordinary people, they're all there. Yeah. Um, they're really active, but Strangers Agroba and Gerakan Pemuda Hijrah, like I said before, they're highly sectarian. So I come to their uh, Majlis Tarim, Ikutan Pengajiannya, I joined their Pengajian. It's highly sectarian and where pretty much Shiites, Ahmadiyas, LGBT they were often cited as the most deviant and the enemies of Muslims and all that. So I felt uncomfortable at the time, but you know, I was just doing ethnography and I had to be comfortable. Yeah. And then there's the Jak Sahabat also, well, people say it's a branch of the Strangers of Groba. Strangers of Groba is based in Jakarta, and then Jejak Sahabat is based in Bandung. Yeah? And then I created another hijrah organization called Better Youth, based in Surabaya. There's also Pang Hijrah in Lampung. Yeah? So there are so many of them. But not all these religious uh, youth groups are actually just like the, hijrah, the first hijrah groups. Yeah? Now, some of them actually that applied sophistic approach to Islam. So they know exactly that young people, especially under council participants, are looking for life guidance. They want to get out from that anxiety. They want to get out from their financial insecurity, all kinds of uh, stresses and depressions. But they disagree with approach and the, 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 the religious characteristics of other hijrah organizations, like Strangers of Roma and Jijak Sahabat Uben Music, or SIF that is highly sectarian and all that, they believe in sophisticated approach that when musicians want to learn about Islam, they don't have to start playing music. They just have to learn another uh, stream of Islam, and that is Sufism. Yeah? Like Komuji and I was part, uh, well, I am still part of Komuji, it's a Komunitas Muslim Manaji. They use that approach. Yeah? Uh, they use sophisticated approach. Uh, there are at least two um, uh, prominent uh, Sufi stream uh, in Komuji. Uh, I forgot what the name. If I remember something and they forgot. But mostly NO people were there. 
Muhammadiyah people were there. They're pretty much progressive young religious people who want to strengthen the Islamic uh, religion, yeah? Islamic learning. So instead of going to the sectarian hijrah groups, some of the underground syndicates were actually going to the uh, Komuji. So sometimes we learn uh, Quran by you know eating snacks. Even some girls now wearing a hijab, and some of them are actually smoking. Yeah? Just like in Edu and Utrbisi, really, really strong like that. And also we play music as well while doing the dawah. Yeah. Uh, they asked me to be one of the ambassadors. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to be your ambassador because that's how they do the uh, uh, recruiting other young people. Like the hijrah groups, they use famous people to be their ambassadors to promote their movement to other young people who have done who haven't done hijrah. Yeah. And that's also the last one, Tasawuf underground movement. Yeah. Uh, I didn't uh, collect data or interview any of the people from Tasaf and the Grand Movement because my field work time is already finished. Like my present design is already finished. So um, probably that's it. And um, yeah, there are other stuff, but I think we can explain the rest of it by uh, doing further discussion. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll return uh, uh, the session to Ali, and hopefully we can engage in discussion. Uh, yes, we're just going to open it up for questions um, from the floor and also from online. Uh, do we have questions online already? Yeah. Does anyone in the room have a question first, or shall we go straight to our online queries? Yes, what? Well, <coughs> can you give your mic? So oh, yes, yeah, um, sorry. Can you right. use the mic? I thought if you could speak really clearly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I just uh, have a simple question about the political economy of the underground, your, the transformation from the radical to the, the more conservative. What, what kind of the political economy that they can by transform their movement? I mean, like when, when they do like the, uh, like, when they got their content, they sponsored by the Tobacco Company and other, but what kind of the political economy that came when they transformed to the Morgan's market? Is there any particular yeah. benefit that they get? Any? Oh, yes. So, uh, should I uh, answer that or just call them first? The no, the just say, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, what name is? Mas Fuad. Hi, Mas Fuad Fanani. Nice to meet you. Um, wait, um, okay, uh, just go to here. Well, I can answer that question by going to the slide that I haven't got the chance to explain it. Yeah. Um, I, I answer your question by uh, explaining about one of the few stories about hijrah and how they get the, you know, the material benefits from joining conservative uh, groups or movements and ideas. Yeah. Um, this is story of Asad, and this is Sedani, not a real name. And um, he is male. He's married with one wife and two kids because some participants have two wives. Uh, and then also he, he has secular educations all his lifetime. And before his hijrah, yeah, he was struggling a lot with his career and jobs. He kept changing jobs from one to another. He tried different businesses and they all failed. Yeah. And then he once worked in an international company owned by, uh, by China, but also it's not satisfying and, and in fact it's exploiting him. So he's, he becomes really gullible. And at the same time, there's family presence from him. And then that's when he becomes really gullible and looking for you know, something to distress him. Yeah. And then uh, he did hijrah in 2017 by firstly looking at or watching religious preachings online on YouTube. Yeah. And then after he learned basic things about Islam through YouTube, and then he uh, decided to go to mosques to see or to join the Ahmadiyya uh, straight away with the you know with the ustads, the famous ustad. He joined Sift. Yeah. And then he decided that he find the most, you know, uh, that he feel comfortable most is actually with the Salafist group, the Jijak uh, Sahaba. And surprisingly, 
he become less stressful. He becomes more happy. He has a clear life orientation. And amazingly, uh, he started a business that is pretty much, it was once successful, but now it's okay. But at least he can live with this business. It's called, it, it's, it's a vaping business. We sell vape liquids, vape equipment and all that. It's really popular among young people at the moment, but not in Australia, it's, it's uh, prohibited, isn't it? Oh, no, it's vape. very popular. Oh, it's very really popular too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, he felt uh, less stressful. He felt more happy. And uh, he just has more clearer life directions right now. And he's doing well with his business. And the second ex uh, example is the story of Donny. Yeah. Uh, he, he was also a part of underground scene participants. And um, he also failed in his businesses. He used to have a big uh, and famous snack business in Bandung, which Bandung is really known for their food culinary businesses. And then because of the competitions in Bandung, this is another effect of the capitalist economic development uh, in uh, urban areas like Bandung and Jakarta. So because there are high competitions among uh, food uh, uh, business entrepreneurs in Bandung, he, had, uh, he felt that he had to expand his businesses by creating different branches in different parts of Bandung city. And he borrowed money a lot from banks, over 1 billion rupiah. And almost all of the businesses pretty much failed. And he could not pay back uh, the money that he, uh, that, that, that he, that he indebted to the banks. And then, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, apa namanya? Orang isok manjar hutang itu. Debt collector. He was chased by different debt collectors who pretty much want to kill him because he couldn't pay back. And he became really stressed. And then his wife's family, his wife's parents pretty much forced him to separate with his wife and kids. Because when he expanded his businesses, he used his wife's name in the contracts uh, when uh, he, he made agreements with the bank. And then, you know, uh, pretty much uh, that didn't make uh, his wife's uh, parents happy. So he became really stressed, he's right from his family, he doesn't have any money, he was chased by debt collectors, he had to hide from one place to a different place, and he only eat once, that is indomie, uh, every day, and he always go to different months to get free food. Yeah. Indeed, that's the political economic benefits for him, uh, the material benefit that he can eat uh, in mosque uh, for free, and then he met some of the hijrah uh, members at uh, a masjid, at a mosque called Masjid al -Latif. And there were former underground scene participants who become really religious. And he said, we're going to help you. If you really want to serious to change your life, we will help you. And then they pretty much are chipping in money in order to help Donnie to be back uh, on his feet again. And now he becomes one of the successful businessmen. He can pay to lots of, uh, he paid all the debts with extra money to the debt collectors. And now he started a new business. He is a producer of vape liquids and many of vape stores really depending on his supply. He's so rich that he uh, gives bonuses to his consumers, sometimes more bucks and cars. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we have a lot of questions online as okay. well. So I'm going to so we're going to actually take um, a live question because there's a journalist in the audience. Uh, Nino has a question. Uh, Nino's from Colmas. Okay. So maybe he's just going to unmute. <coughs> yeah, I think Colmas also covers stories of Hijra as well in their articles. Yeah. <laughs> This is why we don't take live questions. <laughs> technical. Yeah, just technical. Um, you get another one for the room while you get the Yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, so we have a question from Chaitana. Sorry if I get your name wrong. It says, Someone asked me, Indra, the music video you screened, there was a brief uh, image of a young woman with an emblazoned slogan and lyric which is very reminiscent in formal terms of the feminist work of the US artist Barbara Kruger. 
Could you please speak about how you see this in, uh, inserted image functioning within the overall context of imagery, sound, and behavior that would be considered haram? Okay. Well, well, I don't know. Seems like a difficult question, but it's actually simple. It is haram. But that video was actually compiled from different uh, videos or performances, and which I was pretty much picking up from different stuff, different stuff, and combine them. And actually, uh, what's his name? Uh, Brent Fluvas actually studied about this: how underground youth have uh, expanded their entrepreneurial entrepreneurial businesses by copy pasting uh, other people's products from the internet and. Their DIY businesses, their DIY clothing were pretty much also uh, taken, inspired, even some of them like copy pasted and then resell them to their bistro and uh, what? Um, uh, yeah, bistro stores basically. And it was very common and it's a part of uh, their DIY businesses. Uh, Brent Lufas actually uh, stated that in his research that this rebellious underground with their DIY businesses do not really. Uh, rebellious because they're actually uh, the new agents of neoliberalism because uh, they were against capitalism in the past but they ended up to become capitalists themselves by doing this but using the you know the pirated softwares and all that and um, yes in terms of images know that in 2006 this is the time where not many of us were actually done hijra so we didn't care much about that and I think you still remember as well that in the early 2000s when we were still pretty much celebrating uh, press freedom, lots of, you know, uh, what is called as pornographic content in, uh, you know, a sensual media or magazines or newspapers were sold or sold or available everywhere. And in the underground uh, communities, uh, this stuff did not matter, even though you're Muslim. And most of us were not religious, even though those who were religious are pretty much privatized, not really privatized, what do you call it? They will become, they are more private in terms of their uh, religious uh, expressions. Like they never told, they never tell their parents to go pray, don't watch porn, don't watch that sensual images in and all that, because everyone just uh, mind their own business. But things have changed when the hijrah movement emerged, especially popular between probably 2009 to 2018. Um, there are so many young Ustad, those who just done hijrah yesterday. On the, phone, on the next day, he said, you should go so out. You know? uh, another person I remember uh, told his Christian friend, also a punk, uh, to tell him that he should convert to Islam and do pray. <laughs> and this is young, I don't know, this is always the thing that I always find in uh, my experiences as a Muslim activist in the past, uh, that people who are new to religion are pretty much just like playing with a new toy. And they just want to tell everyone to play their games, basically. But those who are really uh, knowledgeable about Islam really have a deep understanding of Islam's good education, formally in an Islamic education institutions. They're really expressing that exactly. So, um, uh, of course, images like that is pretty much haram. And I was actually worried about that, but this is to answer such a question, basically. So we have a question uh, from Angie next week. Thank you, Indra, for an excellent overview of how the punk scene has evolved. Picking up on your final point about punk Muslim, are you able to comment on the recent rise of Muslim women in punk and the all women bands uh, to Grace Punk? Or oh, Voice Bacha Prot. Uh, <laughs> Clownfish, for example. Yeah. Is this phenomena a reflection of punk becoming mainstream? Or is it possibly about punk creating a new space to express women's agency in an increasingly conservative society? Yeah. And following on from this, it seems that men have moved away from the scene, but women are increasingly drawn to the punk scene. Mm. Good question. And that's very Angie's question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Voice of Budget Broad is uh, uh, a female Muslim rock band from the hometown of my parents in Garut. And we were so proud as Garut people. Like, oh, voice of Bacha Prot, go international and all that. But to be honest, as a musician, uh, in my view as a musician, that it's actually nothing that special for us because people like voice of Bacha Prot members were already there since many years ago. Even when I started a punk band in Pesantren in 1990s. 
only because of social media pretty much popularizing this bad and then becomes a big thing. Right? And I think it's a big thing. It's a good thing that we have this female punk rock bands, well, female rock bands uh, that go international and they actually can speak up for themselves. And they're actually criticizing those music, those ex-musicians who did hijra and then band music and all that. Actually, was a wrote, wrote a song about that. You can see it on YouTube. Uh, I think it's a good thing. But just to remind you that it's actually it's not a new thing, actually. Social media that makes them really famous. Yeah. And then second, in the past, if I may uh, take you back to the early 2000s, late 1990s and early 2000s, Alone at last, when I was still active in Alone at last, we were touring together with a female punk band. It's called um, Boys Are Toys. Yes. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a real name, Boys Are Toys. And you perceive boys as toys. Uh, it's, a, it's a feminist statement. And we did uh, some gigs together. It was awesome. But some of the members had gone to Asia. Uh, one of the members, one of, uh, one of the members, she's the guitarist, her name's Queen. Apparently, when I went to do field work, uh, uh, we couldn't find her anywhere. Apparently, she did Hijra and follow Salafi, and he believed that as a Salafi, as a Salafi follower, she may not uh, in contact not only with male uh, friends but also with female participants who have different views with her uh, with her Islamic perspective. It is too extreme, but that's the fact. So yeah, a few other female punk uh, bands were already there. Uh, the good thing about Force of Bajeport is that, um, you know, with the social media things actually center them in the time where probably people are bored with male dominated uh, uh, bands and uh, music performances. And now actually they're touring like internationally. It's amazing. Thing. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of proud of it as a Garut uh, mm -hmm. family member. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, did you say that uh, some of those who have done Hitra in the past actually rejoin uh, mm. playing music again? They just moved from left to right. And yeah. then if that is true, what caused them to join music again? Yep. Okay. Good question. And it has been a question that I asked to my participant when I went back to Indonesia uh, since 2019. Is he still playing? Uh, is he back in the band? No. Is he back in the band? No, nope. okay. Is he back in the band? Yes. So this is interesting. And actually, I was planning to do uh, a post of research about this, but I'm kind of pretty much a bit exhausted with my PhD completion at the moment. Um, I was thinking to do a uh, research on post hijra basically. So what happened to those who did hijra after a few years, a few years of learning uh, Islamic religion through their majlis taklims and all that? Because I have a theory, and that theory uh, has been there when I was active as a Muslim activist in the 1990s, that those who were new to this to an idea, whether leftist or right-wing idea in a movement, they're usually radical in the beginning. They're really extreme. They become not a nice people around. But after a few years of learning, they become more mature, and they become more dewasa. And then they become toning down their uh, religious or political expressions. And then my brother actually, uh, who said to me that if you see a person become radical when they're young, that's a good thing. But radical means like, you know, want to create change for a better world and all that. In that sense, I mean, not become a terrorist or whatever. But if after five years that person is still radical, there's something wrong with the person. So apparently it happens. So after I finished uh, my field work and then back to uh, Paris, write my thesis, not yet finished, back to Indonesia, finishing the thesis there. Then I found out that some actually uh, who, who did hijrah back to their bands and playing music. Reza Noah, for instance. Reza Noah uh, was influenced by Salafi teachings and uh, he decided to stop playing music because he believed music as haram and uh, pretty much, uh, 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 separating him from the real uh, objective uh, in life. And that's back to Allah, yeah, to Islamic path way of life. Uh, but then after a few years, he back in Noah and play music. And apparently there are many others uh, like that in underground scene uh, in 
in Bandung, Jakarta, and other parts of big cities in Indonesia. So some of them decided to stop playing music forever, like Tempak and Uchai of Rock Truckers. He never want to go back to play music. Tempak never want because he believed that music is haram. And you know, without Islamic music, there's no such thing as Islamic music, he said. But uh, Uchai of Rock Truckers, he, he doesn't want to touch or play music instruments, but then he moved to a cappella, which he believed as similar to Nasheed, which is a bit Islamic. He believed that playing music instrument is just really wrong in Islam. But there are others who don't care about that because Islam is more like, uh, how do you expect Islam is more like substantial instead of something formal that you want to see outside or from the service, it's actually what you do in life instead of your outlook as a Muslim or whatever. So yeah, so some of them play music, some of them still not play music. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, please. Oh, <laughs> my unpad fellow. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anita, for your uh, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, you said that in your presentation that you this 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 your movement uh, was very uh, sectarian, yeah, anti uh, Indian, uh, anti 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 so my question is, uh, does this Buddhist movement participate to persecute those uh, those uh, particular uh, yeah. movement here, yeah, those particular fighting in Islam, or just just say that they 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 anti anti but they uh, try at least they uh, participate in persecution persecution to to those uh, thank you. Okay, I also had that experience doing my food work. Before, actually, before my field work, I had news from my friends from high school in Bandung. And this high school is called uh, Mutahari Islamic High School or SMUKUS Mutahari. So if you're aware between the Sunni and Sina uh, Islam, you will know that the name Mutahari uh, reminds you of Shiz because Mutahari uh, itself as a high school is taken from uh, Iranian uh, Muslim scholar who was uh, trying to unite the Sunnis and Shiites in you know the resistance against uh, Shah Reza Pahlavi at the time, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, in 2015, before uh, I go field work, I had news from my friends uh, from there that our school was uh, pretty much surrounded, steeped by uh, gang, uh, motorbike gangsters who apparently just recently declared themselves to, to, uh, to be part of the hijrah movement. And there were, well, there are some speculations, but I agree with uh, what they said, that uh, they were mobilized by uh, a famous uh, Muslim, Indonesian Muslim scholar, a famous Ustaz, but he no longer lives now. Um, so these gang, motorbike gangsters, hundreds of them came to our school and uh, besieged our school. The people, most people don't know that in Islamic high school, it's not only for Shiites only. Sunni and Shi'i, uh, Sunni and Shi'is are there. Actually, most of the students are Sunnis. Some of the teachers are uh, Sunnis. But the thing is that the school is not sectarian. It, we don't care about Sunni or Shi'is. I was Sunni and still Sunni. And I don't care now. <laughs> Some people say that we're actually Susi, Sunni Shi, which means like we don't care about that stuff. But they believe. Uh, that uh, this school is teaching season and that's why it has to be shut down. So they pretty much terrorized uh, my teachers and our junior students there pretty much to, you know, not do our activities. And this is happened in 2015, 2016, when the Sunni Shia sectarianism was on the rise. And this is, uh, in my thesis, I already explained that it's also related to what's happening in the Middle East especially in relation to the Arab Spring. Um, whether the uh, hijab people join uh, such intolerant attacks, some of them yes, some of them not. And in my thesis actually, in the final chapter, no, chapter seven, I explained what uh, my friend, one of my participants said about shift for instance. Yeah? So I asked him exactly the same question. So what do you see uh, organizations like FPI, like uh, what they call it, ANAS, Aliansi Nasional Anti-Shia, and all that. 
what do you see from them? What's your relationship? Because he was part of Shift. What's what's your relationship with this? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, hardliner uh, uh, Islamic organizations or movements? They said, well, Hijrah organizations or groups like us, like uh, like Shift, is pretty much can be uh, the analogikan. What's in English analogikan? <laughs> uh, pretty much it's just like. Their, their relationship with the hardliners is just like relationship with, with Ibu and Ayah. Okay. So hijrah groups like strangers, like Shiv and others, they're pretty much acting like Ibu who try to protect their kids from a dog who try to attack the kids. Okay. And who's uh, beating the dog? It's actually the Ayah. And the Ayah is the hardliners. This is the uh, analogies that my participants said to me. So the relationship is that between Ibu and Ayah. So they're working together, but have different functions. So yeah, it's, it was an interesting answer. And I had to put that in my thesis because okay. So this is from Kevin uh, Nas. What is the demographic of the underground youth involved in the future movement? Urban versus rural, yep. high income, low income, university, etc. Yeah. Mostly, did I explain that in the. I think I did. Uh, the, the, uh, sorry. Yeah. So. Oh, I didn't explain this, sorry. Um, yeah, male and female, but predominantly male. Yeah, And mostly they live in urban areas, big cities like Bandung, Jakarta, Surabaya, Yogyakarta, uh, Medan. Uh, but uh, the biggest one I think in Jakarta and uh, Bandung. Yeah? And they're between 20s to 40s. So less teenagers, but mostly uh, uh, those in this category of age, they're pretty much the ones who've gone hijrah. Some people say that those who did hijrah are not necessarily doing hijrah because they're just following the trend. It's probably true. But the participants whom I talk and before, and they're usually between, mostly, uh, yeah, between 20s and 40s. And this is uh, why I uh, use subcultural theory, contemporary subcultural approach, because they emphasize age as a factor. So when your age changes, your commitment to things changes as well. Your perspective, your perception towards things also uh, towards life has also changed as well. So um, yeah, um, there were female uh, participants as well. But it was very hard to be honest uh, for me to interview some of the some of the female hijab participants because they believe that they should not talk to each other unless well there was a funny story that um uh, if you want to talk to the uh, female participant you have to be oriented towards taruf and then get married i think angie once explained about this in the previous seminar and then the taruf is not uh, just like you know common dating you actually have to be well, different Madri Stalin have different approach. Like in Salman, for instance, there is a case where the guy has to face this way and the female has to go to the other way and they talk. Um, or some of them actually uh, only matched by their ustads or called Murobi. Murobi is more like the mentor of uh, during their uh, uh, religious study in mosque in Madri Stalin. That if you have a problem with dating in a relationship, you want to get married, you just ask your Murabi and the Murabi will find the right person for you, very much like that. Um, but yeah, mostly male, uh, and that explains probably why uh, that age really matters because uh, in Indonesian society, male is supposed to be the one who really providing everything for the family. The problem with underground scene participants because they live in precarious working conditions, many of them unemployed, even though they're working, they don't have enough income, and basically their income is unsustainable, and this created stress over the years. And um, yeah, and then they're finally looking for different ways uh, to, uh, to live their life, and that 
the hijra groups pretty much providing what they need in this kind of situation. So, yeah. So there's another question, a couple of questions from Ari Madana. Um, this one, I think, links to what was talking about now that I mentioned. Um, can, so he understands the story of disappointment and disillusionment, <laughs> but um, can that really explain the reasonable motivation Yeah, probably. It's very hard to encapsulate the whole thesis in this presentation, uh, but I think I can understand uh, this question. So all to the participants are pretty much the solution with not only with their sin, but also with Indonesia in general. Yeah. And those who used to be active in leftist movement, uh, underground youth who, who were active in, uh, in leftist movement, uh, some of them still active now in leftist movements. Yeah. Uh, NIF, for instance, even though it was believed as uh, no longer exists, but apparently it emerges during the, the May Day, I think in 2017, 2018, 2020. Yeah. So basically this defines the characteristic of anarchist movements. It doesn't have to be there the whole time. Yeah? It's there, but it's not there. It will reappear in certain times and conditions and all that. So yeah, this is, uh, this is what I said, uh, what I explained in my thesis as well, that uh, uh, there are some underground people who used to be leftist and sympathize with the left cause are still there, consistent with their ideology, uh, consistent with their movement. Some of them actually pretty much just withdraw themselves, not only from the leftist uh, movement and leftist ideas, uh, but also from the whole underground uh, communities or scene itself. So they, they're just focusing on you know doing what they like, like Pamuji Slamat, for instance, Pam, the former vocalist of Runda. And he was an important ideologue of our uh, punk movement, especially in Bandung. And he's well known in other uh, underground scenes in Jakarta and Surabaya, like we pretty much uh, really respect him. He was so disappointed with the underground scene. He was also disappointed with the leftist movement. He was also disappointed with the country in general. So he decided just, you know, uh, stop in the, uh, being part of the underground and then he just work and do what he likes. I met him actually in 2000. Uh, 22, early 2022, we had a coffee, but I already met, uh, we all, I already met his ideas since 1990s. That was uh, the first time that we made like really meaningful discussions and he explained about that. And he said, you know, your article published by Punk and post Punk Journal really close, really, really good. And that explained the situation at the time. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. But, yeah, pretty much um, what I'm saying is that those participants are still consistent, but some of them who uh, really disillusioned, demoralized, kecewa, uh, besar, they just withdraw themselves from the community, from the movement, and some of them uh, finding new uh, movement, and that was Islamic underground. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I get that you know not everyone wants solutions um, and they're trying to be done. Yeah. So what's the difference? Could they have alternatives? Could they have alternative jobs? I mean, what, what, what's the difference? Oh, uh, uh, they're struggling with their dissolution. <laughs> and if, if, uh, if the people have alternative communities that are not done in the internet, um, not really. Here's the thing about subcultural participants like me, even though I work in an established institution in a university, Fajar University, and few other participants also have a similar career to me. Career to me. Um, for other uh, underground uh, subcultural participants, um, we have to live in a life where it's very hard to adapt because we used to be uh, living in a social environment where everyone has to be treated equally, pretty much. I don't care if you're older or younger than me, you just friend to me and all that. And we don't like to be told. And when, when 
when when my party when, when underground participants work in a company or in any institution that employs me, they find it hard to be able to you know work comfortably there because they had to deal with uh, the bossy directors and uh, also with the authoritarian style of you know uh, uh, employing them and all that. Like what happened to Uchai, uh, the former guitarist of Lorna Abbas, he was also very unhappy the fact that he had to work in, in uh, exploitative conditions uh, and he had to work like many hours until late at night, but he's not paid. Tidak dibayar kerja lembur. So as far as I know, because they don't have any other alternative, so far until now, those the spaces that I explained, the Islamic underground movement collectives, uh, the hijrah groups and all that, those are the alternatives that I found and within that particular context. I don't know what's gonna happen in the next five years. I don't know what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. Maybe they have new ideas. And that's pretty much what my one of my thesis examiners uh, told me that my thesis actually uh, challenges uh, the existing subcultural theorists who believe that once subcultures being uh, domesticated, being co-opted, the resistance doesn't end there. It will keep continue changing. It will keep continue adapting with the new social, political, and economic circumstances. And I believe in that. And that's what I found from uh, my research. So I don't know what's going to happen in the next five or 10 years. Probably there will be new collectives. Oh, actually, there's one. Those who try to reconcile between being a Muslim and Islamist at the same, same time being uh, leftist. Uh, there, uh, you know, Tufal Al Jifari, the, the guy who used to be in part of One Finger Movement and Buraba Mitan Tawid or Al Tawid, after he had fallen out with Ayik or Ali Jabir Rahman, a few years later he decided to become a Salafi and not play music. But now, since 2018, I think, he returned and then he revived Underground Tawid as a collective, but now longer sectarian and he married Islamism with anarchism. So uh, anarchy, anarcho-Islam, what he said. Um, but it only happened like in a very serial, uh, short period of time. Uh, I think in 2018, it was something like, whoa, this is something new, exactly answering your question. But then uh, I checked again uh, when I was completing my thesis, uh, his website is not there anymore. <laughs> so I don't know what's happened. Maybe it's because the Indonesian government has declared a new boogeyman. The past was communist and now anarcho syndicalist is considered as the enemy of the state as well. And that's why probably he had to turn it down and all that. But that's also another uh, example how uh, underground participants seem to be continue experimenting with their resistance. We have time for one more question. I have a thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Well, well, the first one is related to, I think, the, when you're talking about Hijra, the Asia, which is important, uh, as a yeah. as a as a move from one you know, from the secular culture. Yeah. And I can understand that. But the, the young uh, underground steam now, yeah. a lot of them probably don't, is it true that they don't expect Hijra? They are already conservative. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, all I can think about. Mm. And the second is related to the, uh, yeah, what are the alternatives for those who are not, you know, that doesn't feel to be here, uh, but want to continue in this uh, underground scene, are they, and, and also still active in music? Yeah. Are most of them who are going to become faulted? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I can answer that from the, from a perspective as an academic, and also as a perspective as a musician. We're struggling materially <laughs> because okay. Uh, which question should I answer first? Oh, they were conservative from the beginning, probably, and that is actually what uh, some scholars from SIS and UNPAD. Uh, who published a research about the conservative turn that Indonesian Muslims, especially in West Java, were already conservative before this hijrah trend and all that. Um, that's probably true, uh, but not necessarily agree with that because 
that doesn't count uh, that that assumption doesn't count the fact that actually even when uh, when these Muslim, young Muslims were conservative well uh, you know uh, rather conservative they're actually struggling with their uh, uh, how the best way to uh, believe their beliefs for instance I was conservative like I was part of an underground Islamist movement in 1990s within the context of resistance against the new order. I was conservative. And, but then uh, as the time changes and then we continue learning and all that, I was trying to moderate myself with the new teachers, with the new Majlis Stalin, with the new Islamic group, with new participants that I can talk to and all that. And I consider myself become pretty much secular and I no longer believe in what I used to believe in the past. And, uh, and I was not alone. So it's, I think it's a bit unfair just to call the person as conservative, that's it, without seeing the possibility for the person to change. Same thing with uh, those who did hijrah in an extreme way, not playing music, uh, not talking to uh, the, uh, people with different uh, sex uh, identities and all that. Because I believe that these participants will change, but I don't know what kind of change that they will uh, go to. And then second about the uh, uh, those who keep playing music. Yeah, the, the, the someone to be drunk, are they all? Involved? Yeah, they're just being themselves like everyday life. And yeah, they just want to play music. They just want to be given space to perform. The problem is that something that I forgot to mention here is that uh, playing or having performances and shows for us as musicians, especially underground musicians, um, we have so many talented musicians and bands but we don't have enough venues and uh, events uh, to play. So as a musician, as a part of a band, uh, I want to be performing. I don't care if there's like not many people, but I just want to be performing. And that's what the key thing, and that's what the what other musicians uh, always think of. But at the same time, there are some of us who actually started thinking about, you know, because they don't have any sustainable work uh, and income, so they're really relying on performing in order to get money. And that happened actually to some of my friends. I was actually relying on that actually because I don't have to explain that. Um, to add extra income, actually, you just need to join tours, do tours, uh, performance in different uh, events and all that, and then you get money. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that since 2008, there was this incident called uh, a tragedy Sabtu Klabu, uh, the Great Saturday where uh, it was a metal show. It was held in a historic place of Asia Africa Conference Building. And that's pl that place is only enough to, uh, it's only enough for 600 people, but people who attended the place was like almost a thousand people. So 11 people died because of, you know, stupid crowd and being stoned and all that. And that created a difficult for us to organize events and also to perform. Some of underground bands and musicians were blacklisted by the police. My band was not blacklisted because it's not really that, you know, uh, hardcore or strong anyway. It's still considered pop for some people. And uh, since, because, since that, many of us could not find income because there's no events and all that. And then when uh, the ban of underground or music events was li uh, lifted by the government, and then the price to rent uh, venues was so ridiculously expensive that we cannot afford to rent venues, expect, uh, except for those who, who are consistent with the IY shows, the small numbers of people uh, at the venues. So we instead rely on sponsorship. And the only people and companies who have that financial capability is corporations. And I think that's the problem because Many of us who kept, kept getting money from these companies, tobacco companies to perform, uh, we had fun and all that on the stages, but there's a material inequality there. If you're a good musician, if, you, if your band is really good, but you don't have much followers, you're not that famous, yeah? then you won't get paid at all because the organizers know that you're at least looking for you know, stage to perform. So, sorry, we don't have money, you're not gonna pay because you need us basically. But those who are really famous, they have big followers, like say Burger Kill, for instance, Indonesian famous metal band, uh, being paid like really, really, really expensive. So this is 
the thing that I criticized in my thesis that, okay, uh, there's always debate and controversy about using corporate sponsorship. Yeah? Okay, we can get extra income money from uh, performing in that events, but why nobody cares about this inequality between musicians? I thought we're underground uh, communities. Yeah? There shouldn't be you know, uh, discrimination against us. But that's the reality of, of performing in, under, uh, in a tobacco company sponsored events. Yeah? They helped us to organize music, big music events. But at the same time, it doesn't change the problem of matter and quality of most underground. So, yeah. So we are over time, but we have one more really uh, pressing question on uh, from our online audience. So uh, if you don't mind, we'll go ahead with the what actual last question. <laughs> okay, this is our um, uh, this coming from online, and it's about future orientation. So do people intend to draw to HDI ideology? Are there also other Islamic ideologies? Are uh, they becoming supporters of violent extremism? Okay. Ooh. Quick response. Quick response. Okay. All right. Um, yes, like I said, those who were dissatisfied with relations with the leftist movement, some of them shifted to uh, Islamist collectives such as the what, Liberation Youth and Humble Community. And as you probably know, even though uh, Hatay activists were often uh, say uh, fiery things, you know, like pretty uh, aggressive towards their enemies, their secular people, nationalists, and whatever. Um, they're actually non-violent. They uh, Hatai people uh, use non-violent approach in their dakwah, in their recruitment, in their campaign. Their main objective is to establish caliphate. And that means, well, it's going to be a long story, but I don't want to explain that too long. Basically, they have to recruit the younger generation to support their Islamist agenda, to establish caliphate mode. But the one thing that probably I didn't mention much in my thesis, and I haven't mentioned uh, at all in this presentation, is that I found out that actually some of those who used to be part of the Hatta'i link uh, Islamic collectives, they were disillusioned with Hatta'i itself because Hatta'i seemed to be, not seen, but arguably uh, could not change anything with their approach, with their nonviolent approach. So in order to create change, they become more radical. Yeah? And some of them actually joined ISIS. Yeah? Um, some of my participants in Surabaya said to me that uh, some of punks in West Java uh, kept, content, kept contacting him and he felt annoyed because he knew that his, uh, his friends from West Java is actually a band and they become uh, you know, uh, pledge allegiance to ISIS. And he said that uh, some of them have gone to Syria and Iraq. Bahru Naim is another example. Bahru Naim used to be part of Hatay, and then he dissatisfied with the Hatay's non-violent approach, and then he joined ISIS. One finger under the movement in 2016 were accused by, uh, well, it's based on Tempo's investigation that uh, one finger under the movement is linked to the terror attack in Sarina uh, in 2016 because of the witness uh, in, uh, in, in, in one of the prisons in Jakarta who said that Bahrun Naim was one visited by young people who were punk and metal outlooks. And then uh, he said that they're from one finger underground movement. But this is then uh, rejected by uh, Ombat, the founder of one finger movement himself. He said that, no, we're not linked to any of this group, terror group, and we have no link to this terror attack. And I said that, that I think in, uh, in my, uh, thesis. So, um, yeah, there are some uh, parts of these people who uh, did hijrah to Hatai and then hijrah again to the more radical uh, versions of the movement, including ISIS. I did not dare, well, actually, I did not know how to find people who join ISIS, but I think it would be against the ethical committee if I do that. <laughs> Maybe Kate and I wouldn't be safe <laughs> anymore if I could not get the interview. But yeah, <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. And that You're was welcome. really fascinating. Thank you for everyone joining in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ah, done.